So, uh, you know, it would be easy for me simply to moderate the discussion, uh, but I think I have a reputation to live up to, uh, at least among some of my, my Indian friends, uh, a number of whom are, are your uh, ambassadorial uh, compatriots. Uh, and while we have uh, been able to maintain a very uh, close, and in some instances an exceptionally close uh, relationship, uh, we also uh, have disagreed over the years in terms of the, kind of the narrative uh, about uh, India's nuclear ambitions and its impact on both disarmament and non-proliferation. So I might have present at least a few, raise a few questions, maybe an alternative uh, narrative, mine will be much more concise, but I want to at least put it on the table because I think it will make it uh, perhaps more interesting in, in terms of the discussion. Although before I do that, I, I should mention, uh, we, we now seem to have uh, a very Indian flavor to the center. Uh, as uh, you may or may not know, uh, only last week we had another very distinguished young uh, Indian scholar currently spending, uh, uh, the, I think actually the next two years at Stanford, uh, another Dr. Joshi, who uh, spoke about the kind of long and convoluted history of the Indian nuclear submarine program. So uh, you follow in that, uh, 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 you follow his uh, <coughs> fascinating presentation on another dimension of, of Indian nuclear activities. The story that I wanted to relate, which you may not have heard even though you were in, in uh, Vienna for uh, a number of years, I didn't know if you knew David Fisher. Yes. David uh, was uh, a very distinguished uh, uh, diplomat who left uh, both uh, Zim uh, Rhodesia at the time and then South Africa because he was simply not willing to tolerate their apartheid activities and joined the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, and became the head of uh, what is now essentially uh, external affairs. Uh, and David spent several years in Monterey as a diplomat in residence, uh, following a number of other senior uh, such uh, uh, diplomats here. Yeah. And he told me a, a fascinating story. He was uh, apparently at the side of uh, the then director general, uh, a man by the name of Eklund, who uh, before he, be, he joined the International Atomic Energy Agency had been uh, the head of the Swedish nuclear weapons program. Uh, and in 1974, May 1974, at the time of the uh, Indian nuclear test, uh, Eklund had drafted a congratulatory note uh, to send to India. Uh, and David uh, Fisher had to uh, intervene and uh, to remind Director General uh, Eklund that while uh, in his prior role as head of the Swedish nuclear weapons program, that might have been a, an appropriate message to send. Uh, it didn't square with his current responsibilities as the uh, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. So I'm not sure if that's been reported elsewhere, but I thought it was a, an interesting anecdote uh, related to uh, the 1974 test. Um, a, few, a few questions here. Um, I actually had the opportunity uh, to attend uh, the 1995 MPT Review and Extension Conference, which was presided over by a mutual uh, friend, Jyotha de Nepal, a Sri Lankan uh, diplomat, undersecretary general, president of that particular review conference. Um, and I would interpret the outcome of that conference uh, very differently uh, than the way you characterized it as a demonstration of the commitment by the nuclear weapon states to retain their nuclear weapons indefinitely. Uh, mind you, uh, this was a conference attended by a very large number of very diverse states, including <coughs> a majority who were members of the non movement. <laughs> Uh, including very significantly uh, a new uh, government in South Africa which had uh, indigenously developed nuclear weapons uh, but renounced them and joined the uh, NPT as a non-nuclear <coughs> state. In order for the treaty to be extended indefinitely, uh, there were two other decisions that were taken and also a, a resolution dealing with the Middle East. In those decisions, 
uh, involved uh, strengthening the key review process and also a set of principles and objectives for disarmament and non-proliferation. So the, the overwhelming view of the international community that was represented in New York in 1995 was that the non-proliferation treaty served their national interests and the interests of non-proliferation and disarmament so that it should be extended indefinitely. But moreover, because of the commitments to disarmament, there were other decisions that were undertaken. So uh, I would disagree in terms of, of your characterization of, of, uh, of what was accomplished. Um, I won't go into the details at, at, at the moment, but uh, uh, I have a very different uh, interpretation of the dramatic reversal in US policy with respect to uh, its uh, domestic law and the decision in 2005 to alter that, uh, that domestic law, as well as the exemption that was granted uh, to India by the Nuclear Suppliers Group in 2008. And so I suggest we talk about that subsequently. But one other uh, point that I do want to, to raise here, which I find a little bit uh, confusing in terms of the argument, Ambassador, that, that you developed here. And that has to do uh, with the uh, negotiation uh, that was concluded on July 7th last year uh, in New York uh, under the guidance of Ambassador Elaine White uh, to uh, prohibit nuclear weapons, the so-called ban treaty or the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a treaty uh, that has been roundly criticized by all of the nuclear weapon states, uh, except, well, all of them have been critical of it, as have all of the nuclear weapons possessors who are not NPT states parties. But what's odd about this, from my vantage point, is that uh, the nuclear weapon states who have criticized this treaty have criticized because they see it as being very detrimental to the non-proliferation treaty. So my question to you is, given India's stance with respect to the discriminatory nature of the NPT, why should India stand apart from the overwhelming majority of countries in the world and the nearly entire community of the non-aligned movement uh, in opposing the Prohibition Treaty, a treaty which is also uh, roundly deplored by the nuclear weapon states uh, because they don't want to make a commitment uh, to disarm in the fashion that is, uh, in fact, pronounced by the, uh, the ban treaty. So those are at least a few things I want to put on the table. Uh, some of the ambassador may wish to speak to, others around the room may wish to, uh, to raise questions, but hopefully that will give us uh, a number of, of topics to, uh, sure. to discuss. Should I respond? If you wish, it's up to you. Okay. Pick, you can pick it Especially, of course, uh, you, Dr. Potter, you are most free to have your own views on uh, the whole issue, and uh, that we do not agree or we agree to disagree is an equally good factor. Uh, the uh, point is that uh, I see a situation whenever nuclear non proliferation treaty is spoken of in the context of either the nuclear weapon states or in the context of the majority, as you call it, of nations around the world, including those in the non-aligned, uh, the uh, convenient system is to forget that there is an Article 6 to this treaty, which nuclear weapon states have never lived by. If they were to fulfill this, then it would have some meaning for a treaty on prohibition of nuclear weapons as was signed last year or was negotiated last year in New York. How can we be a party to something which continues to prolong the same agony of discrimination between haves and have-nots? If we are to sign the prohibition treaty, that would mean we have to give up uh, nuclear weapons. So then what? the whole argument goes upside down. 
and also uh, it's great of you to say that a large number of countries did this but between us we know that uh, whether Tonga agrees to de denuclearize or not it's not going to make too much of a difference but uh, the, it's the people who have the nuclear weapons and that's why I prefer the term states with nuclear weapons to nuclear weapon states uh, th that they have to take a collective decision to make a determined effort to go in for a phased, universal, non-discriminatory system for eliminating nuclear weapons. You mentioned South Africa. I am sorry, but uh, I will be very in, 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 uh, undiplomatic in mentioning that it was the white South Africa which gave up the nuclear weapons because they were afraid that it would go to the black South Africa. So it's not as if South Africa showed that they were one remarkable country which gave up nuclear weapons for the sake of giving it up and they were an example of what other countries did not do. Had South Africa remained 2% black and 98% white, I am sure the decision to keep nuclear weapons would have been different. So uh, what I am trying to say is that uh, our position, you cannot, uh, you know, in, whether it is a question of 1945 and the uh, United uh, UN uh, Security Council, or it is a question of the NPT, or it is a question of who you designate as a state with nuclear weapon or nuclear weapon state. The arguments have to go with the changes that evolve in the world order. Today, Britain and France and these countries are not in any of the positions that they were in 1945. And uh, nor are these Britain, in, I mean, tomorrow if uh, Scotland secedes, Britain will have to gift her Poseidon nuclear uh, submarine to the US to maintain. So it's a different world order we are talking of. So when we talk in 2018, we will have to see those countries which are relevant to the conversation. And that is where I feel that there is a difference in the um, dialogue. Okay. Uh, we obviously have two very different perspectives. I will resist the temptation to respond at the moment. I do want to say something further, though, about South Africa. Uh, uh, but I will pause for the moment and uh, give the floor to others who would like to speak. If you could kind of raise your hand, and I'll ask you to identify yourself and then ask a question. Surat, please. Uh, my name is uh, Sharad Joshi, and I teach in the Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Studies program here. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, one deals with uh, India's uh, quest to gain uh, membership of the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Now, as we see, as India has uh, um, has set upon this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this objective of gaining full membership of uh, the NSG. We also see uh, you know, demands from Pakistan to be accorded exactly the same uh, treatment first for the NSG waiver, and then uh, saying that uh, uh, that if India gets uh, membership, then Pakistan should be uh, allocated this membership as well. So I wonder if you could uh, you know. Uh, give us your opinion on where India stands on uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, demands for uh, the same kind of uh, treatment. I think the question you should be asking yourself is where the international community stands in with regard to giving Pakistan such a position. Because uh, the fact is that um, we, India is a classic non-proliferator. You examine our non-proliferation record, have we ever sold anything or bought anything connected with uh, nuclear weapons? Have we uh, given the bomb to anybody else or taken it from somebody else? You know, we have a joke in the nuclear establishment where I was working in uh, 1998 that uh, Pakistan exploded its nuclear device two weeks after we did. And I must tell you, because I was in the department in that time, that uh, every day after we tested, we waited to hear reports about Pakistan testing. And it took two weeks. Why? We suspect it's because they were translating the manual from Chinese to English. So, you know, don't put Pakistan in the same bracket as India. It's not a non-proliferator 
it's not in the same bracket. It did not have nuclear technology or weapons or any other thing till the um, 70s. And I don't think I want, because we are being taped, to go into the conversation of who brought the technology from which country. You are aware of the Netherlands connection. So let us, you know, set at rest the fact that you are comparing to and bringing in the dialogue about a country which has no connection with and cannot be put on the same platform as us. Uh, I mean, I didn't mean to compare what I, uh, what I have. So there is no question of our having any opinion on this yeah. because we feel that this is irrelevant. I mean, you cannot have, are you going to give a drunkard a car to drive which he'll crash? No. So the same logic. You cannot give a country which is irresponsible and has demonstrated irresponsibility uh, the same position as uh, a country which has, through 70 years, demonstrated irresponsibility. I think, I mean, in fact, uh, the approach that is increasingly gaining traction within the community of nuclear supplier group states is to move toward a criterion-based approach rather than a country-specific approach. Um, uh, I don't see anybody being admitted in the short term, whether it's India or Pakistan or Israel. But I think there is an inclination to uh, agree upon a set of criteria uh, which a country would have to meet uh, before any action is taken to uh, admit them to the, uh, the nuclear suppliers group. That's my reading of the, uh, the current partaking of the, uh, of the current policy. Who, who else would like to uh, kind of weigh in here? Yes, please, Ms. Hi. You want to identify yourself? Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for the very informative and insightful presentation. And uh, my name is Masako. I'm a project manager and a research associate at the center. And uh, I'm originally from Japan. And I'm promoting disarmament education relatively younger generation. So it's kind of a follow-up question on uh, the Dr. Porter's question, the India's attitude toward the nuclear weapons ban treaty. And I'm not so convinced by what you said, I, I'm sorry to say that, but because of uh, India's uh, disarmament spirit, especially the, you know, I'm originally from Japan, so I'm at the most respect for the India, the original uh, spirit in disarmament. And uh, I read uh, what, you know, uh, you said after the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. And given all those historical background, I really think this ban treaty is a very good treaty. You could uh, show your uh, leadership in nuclear disarmament, but uh, after the con uh, adaptation of the ban treaty, July 7th last year, and a couple of weeks later, I, I saw the some uh, statement of the government that uh, the government is committed to the nuclear disarmament, but not convinced by the effectiveness of the ban treaty. I think uh, uh, your government issued that kind of uh, information. So, so I would like to ask you, that what kind of uh, condition or you would be convinced to join the ban treaty, or just your prospect of your your prospect toward the ban treaty? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, when you say ban treaty, you mean uh, yes. the nuclear prohibition, yes, uh, that was not the, the comprehensive test ban treaty? It, not not, not CBT, okay. the nuclear treaty nuclear, of the nuclear. prohibition okay. of nuclear weapons. You see, uh, we would be the happiest if the nuclear, what do you call it, nuclear treaty for, no, prohibition of nuclear weapons. Treaty on the prohibition, treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. weapons. We would be the happiest to see that treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons come into fruition as early as possible. But there are certain conditionalities required for this. It is not possible to expect India unilaterally to accede to such a treaty, even though it be conceived with the, the, the idea and the ideals behind the treaty. It is not possible to concede to it unless other states with nuclear weapons <coughs> also simultaneously concede. We have been saying over and over again that if Article 6 of the NPT were obeyed, if the other states with nuclear weapons agreed to a phased de-escalation, de then eventually we will get to a stage where we will be all having so few weapons that we could agree to get in to go for 
denuclearization by all of us. That is called actually a singularity. <laughs> but uh, we are not seeing any moves by the United States or by Russia or by China or even by the others in uh, moving in this direction. So our unilateral movement in this direction is not going to help uh, the treaty come into existence. I mean, it's not going to solve, make the spirit and letter of the treaty be implemented. It's only going to be another signature which will in, uh, end up denying us the right to do things which other people are doing. First of all, I mean, the treaty will enter into force after 50 countries uh, have uh, ratified it, with or without uh, the uh, nuclear weapon states or other nuclear weapons possessors. So there's a question of being in force as opposed to uh, having its desired intent. But just for being taken just for uh, uh, purposes of, uh, of clarification, um, I mean, one might ask the question. Uh, if, in fact, you uh, disagree with the content of the Prohibition Treaty, uh, why didn't you participate in its negotiation? I mean, this is a criticism that I will direct and have directed to my friends in Washington and Moscow and Beijing and Paris and London. It's easy to complain about the product, uh, but as the Americans are fond of telling other parties uh, in negotiations, for example, having to do with the WMD free zone in the Middle East, you have to be around the table if you're going to have an impact on the outcome of the deliberation. So I think uh, it is not easy to defend the absence uh, by any of the nuclear weapons possessors uh, in the negotiations of the treaty. And one could go back a little bit uh, and look at the absence of the same parties at the open-ended working group. This is even less defensible. At the open-ended working group, uh, which uh, was not preordained to make a recommendation to establish a treaty to negotiate a ban on nuclear weapons. There were a number of other outcomes that might have come out of that. Uh, and I think it's most unfortunate for those who are critical, at least of the, uh, of the ban treaty uh, content, not to have participated in these formative uh, negotiations. Um, the other point is, I just I have to be somewhat respectful of uh, Chatham House rule uh, considerations as I speak here. But if I understood, Ambassador, your remarks about uh, uh, what would have happened or would not have happened with respect to uh, uh, retention of nuclear weapons by South Africa. If your implication, as I understood it, was that uh, had this been a, uh, a nuclear weapon uh, possessed by the AMC, uh, that they would have taken a very different stance uh, in terms of uh, foregoing the nuclear weapon and, and participating as they did uh, in the uh, uh, 95 review conference. I don't think that corresponds at all with that. I mean, I had occasion uh, only a little over a week ago to spend three week or three days rather with uh, one of the most distinguished uh, uh, South African diplomats, who you may know, Abdul Minty, yeah. uh, who uh, was the direct emissary of uh, President Mandela uh, at the review conference, and uh, I can tell you. Uh, that his orientation with respect to nuclear weapons certainly doesn't correspond to the idea that uh, an ANC-led South Africa would have had anything to do with nuclear weapons. Uh, so I, I think that, that simply is, uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, is not correct. And in fact, at the time uh, that uh, uh, the ANC became the leadership of South Africa, uh, they had and uh, continue to have an exceptionally large stock of highly enriched uranium. They could very easily reconstruct their nuclear weapons as they did in the past when they built six of them, took them apart, rebuilt them. That is the old regime. So I, I just simply don't don't agree with uh, you know with that interpretation. And finally, you know, you, you mentioned a uh, uh, a very tiny country and contrasts Tonga with. Uh, uh, 
the other states. But those other states included countries, uh, again, NAM members, uh, NAM observers, uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, we can, Indonesia, Malaysia. I mean, uh, we can construct a list of the entire world absent a few countries. Uh, and those were the countries that decided uh, that it was in their interest and in the interest of international uh, peace and security uh, to extend indefinitely the non-proliferation treaty. So the question that I derive from that uh, kind of lengthy observation is what is the view of India today about the value of the non-aligned movement, which it once led, when the overwhelming majority of, of NAM members participate in the NPT, endorse the ban treaty, endorse the comprehensive test ban treaty? Uh, is there not a growing either split between India and the NAM, or does India perhaps see the non-aligned movement as increasingly irrelevant uh, for its uh, foreign policy objectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, as you know, we were one of the founding members of the NAM, the non-aligned movement. Uh, but firstly, we are, India is larger than any of the other NAM countries in terms of uh, population. Secondly, we are in a geopolitical location where we are confronted by two non-democratic nuclear armed states. Now in such a condition, our policy has to be dictated by our self-interest. It's not a question of trying to see what the collective self-interest of non-aligned movement is going to be. And, uh, while we still value the non-aligned movement as a, as a body which represents developing countries and which uh, develop, uh, which represents the aspirations of uh, inclusive growth, I do not think that merely because there are dis differences between NAM members on issues like uh, CDBT or FMCT or NPT or anything else, that that means that we no longer feel that NAM is relevant or that that is impinging on the relationship we have with NAM. Our requirements in this particular area are governed by the peculiar circumstances which we are in. Can you point out any other country in the world which faces the threats we have of two nuclear armed neighbors who are both non-democratic? You can't. So. This is a situation where uh, we have to take a special position. I mean, the West recognizes Israel as having a special position because they feel they are surrounded by people of different religion. But the West doesn't seem to realize that we have the same problem. So, in many ways, when you talk of NAM, it's great in terms of, as I said, inclusive growth and other issues. But it is not something which we feel enters into our non-proliferation or our uh, discussion on disarmament issues. Others care to uh, to intervene here, please. Yes. Well, talking about you want to introduce yourself, for everybody. Uh, Most of them know me. <laughs> my name is Surinder Rana. I come from the Defense Language Institute and. Uh, it is my privilege to be part of uh, uh, having uh, the ambassador here, and I'm very pleased that the ambassador accepted. Uh, so my question is uh, that talking about nuclear supply as group, as it stands, China's position doesn't seem to be kind of uh, reconciliatory. In this. So, what are the implications for India's nuclear ambitions and nuclear program in the long run? And also, that India has bilateral arrangements with other countries to buy the fuel. So, does India really need the uh, nuclear supply groups 
membership. Okay, firstly, on the question of uh, China and us on the nuclear suppliers group, I remain hopeful because, you know, uh, the first dialogue which India started with a group which essentially began against India, against India's 1974 test, uh, was in 1997 and I was a part of the Indian delegation which went for the first meeting uh, where we, in fact, people asked us why we went to meet the enemy. Uh, we were in that meeting of the NSG because then we wanted to start a dialogue. And this was before the 98 tests. And uh, so I, uh, at that point, you know, it looked ridiculous. Everything looks ridiculous. Uh, similarly, uh, in uh, 2000, when I was in Vienna, uh, we, I was uh, studying the Chinese model additional protocol, which they were planning to, they had put uh, to the IAEA. And uh, I took a lot of inspiration from there because they were a nuclear weapon state. And uh, we wanted to enter the, to formulate a model addition protocol on similar lines. So that uh, when when the, the initial paper which I did present, people were saying it will never be accepted. Please see the model addition protocol of 2009. It is uh, we have not accepted the things which uh, were dictated to us, and we have entered in special conditions for us. So I remain optimistic that. Given the fact that we are not, we are pursuing something which in our view and I think in the collective view is for the greater good. If you are to make sure that climate change is, uh, I mean, that does not uh, end up uh, drowning us all, we have to make sure that we generate more nuclear energy and we do not do coal. 75% of our <coughs> power uh, supply can, can be about 336 uh, gigawatts. Uh, so about 75 percent of it is uh, based on coal and natural gas. Uh, and you know, you've seen the ill effects of coal in uh, China, you've seen the ill effects of coal in India, and the choking which is happening in cities uh, like Delhi and Bombay and elsewhere. It is a no brainer that we need to move away from hydrocarbon fuels to, from coal. And uh, therefore, nuclear energy for us is something which uh, is a very important uh, thing. So, I think in the long run, I remain optimistic about uh, even China's view on the NSG. And uh, sorry, the second part was uh, you said. Uh, then we have the bilateral. Ah, we have bilateral. No, you see, the nuclear suppliers group uh, ties up people in knots because uh, it has not just supply of nuclear materials. It also has dual use goods. So when you are uh, trying to do anything in the nuclear arena, if you, it's not enough just to get supply of uranium. You need much more than that. You, you need to make sure that um, certain types of steels are available, certain types of metals are available, certain types of niobium and molybdenum and other materials are available, uh, certain types of specialist magnets are uh, capable of being imported. So it's a it's a long molecular pumps for uh, power reactors. So it's a whole host of things that are required. And uh, by uh, not being a part of the NSG, we are either having to reinvent the wheel in each case, which is a very long process, or in uh, you know going on a case by case basis, which is not the case if you are part of the NSG. Okay. Um, I'll pass. Pause again. Uh, res responding who, who would anybody else like to to contribute? Sam, you want to introduce yourself? Um, yes, hello. Th uh, thank you, Ambassador. My name is uh, Sam Meyer. I'm a researcher here at the uh, Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. And I have a question that uh, is a bit unrelated to, well, not necessarily unrelated, but you, you used the term credible minimum deterrence uh, with regards to the policy of uh, India's nuclear weapons program. And is there a consensus in the Indian government and the policy community as to what that means? And is there, is, has India achieved a credible minimum deterrence? Okay. Uh, firstly, I mean, are you from India? <laughs> no, you're not. 
then you must tell you that the first thing about India is that uh, we have 1.3 billion people and about 1.6 billion opinions. So, to say whether India has achieved the uh, consensus, you know, it will never happen. It is not something which is happening. But it doesn't mean that just because we are arguing between, among ourselves that we don't have common ideas. There is a common idea that the vast majority of India does not want to be in a position of nuclear inferiority, so to speak, if you can, if that has any meaning. Secondly, this whole word credible nuclear deterrent is meaningless in my view and in the view of many um, people in the nuclear weapons area also, there because uh, you, I mean, what is the, you know, the largest nuclear test which was done, I think was Zar Bomba, which was 58 megatons. You throw one Zar Bomba, you're, they, they have speculated that if the Zar Bomba were buried in the earth, it would probably split the earth inside. So, you know, we are talking about weapons which we actually cannot use. I don't think any sane person or country is thinking of using this. That is why the word deterrent is used in the first place. And uh, your word credible nuclear deterrent, you know, we, we I think, were a very responsible power in the sense that uh, right from the start, right from when we started having a weaponization program, we declared no first use, no use against, non-use against non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, so the whole purpose is to make sure that there is an awareness outside, especially in the borders that we have, that uh, this is a country with weapons. So the minimum is dictated by that kind of perception sharing which is being done in terms of uh, nuclear weapons. Exactly how many numbers are going to be necessary and all this will become one of those uh, racing games. You know, somebody will tell you that Pakistan has so many and China has so many and US has so many, many, many more. <laughs> so you have the chasing game, so to speak. I don't think we are working on that kind of a numbers game, but I think we are aware of the fact and we hope the rest of the world is also aware of the fact that these are not things you can actually deploy. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something which is your, your, you have and ideally you should work together to try to not have. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the world is turning around and one set of people who have it are telling the others, why don't you not have? So it's like the fox without the tail, you know. So the fox without the tail was telling all the other foxes, cut off your tail. So it's not a sensible idea, in my opinion, to preach to, uh, for a nuclear weapon country, to preach to a non-nuclear weapon country or to another nuclear weapon country to disarm unless they are having sincerity in doing so themselves. And that is the basis on which our uh, fundamental understanding of uh, the credible nuclear deterrent is built and that is the basis on which we work when we talk of how many we need and how much we should have. I think that's also unfortunately or fortunately a problem in terms of India's relationship to the majority of the non line movement members because uh, they hold up the principle of disarmament but they regard many of the things that they would like for themselves to be distinct from what they would like the rest of the world to, to pursue. Um, but I'm curious if I can ask a, a question. I, I thought that uh, uh, Surinda's point is an important one that, that we should explore a little bit further. Because it's not clear, at least to me, and maybe I don't fully understand uh, the uh, nature of deci the decision making process in the nuclear suppliers group, including with respect to uh, the 92 new use. Uh, uh, requirements. But having received the exemption already in 2008, I don't think membership in the group has any bearing on what India can or cannot import or how they may engage in trade relations with other countries. Um, in fact, my criticism is, is much less directed toward India, which has done a very skillful job of negotiating uh, an exemption which I think is very beneficial to it. It's more critical of uh, those countries 
who have other, not only politically binding, but legally binding obligations not to engage in nuclear trade in countries lacking full scope safeguards. Here I'm talking about members of nuclear weapons free zones, including those in uh, Rarotonga, Pelandaba, and my own favorite, Central Asia, who are simply ignoring their legally binding prohibitions uh, that are both in the form of international law and in domestic law. And so it seems to me it's really much more a question of prestige. Um, I mean, I will talk privately to other Indian diplomats who more or less acknowledge this as well. You know, they, they are losing, they are, by putting the NSG as such an important objective and sacrificing so much capital to try to obtain membership uh, and continuing to twist arms as best they can by those countries who are not necessarily disposed to grant membership. And there's been some regression in terms of some of these countries. Um, it seems to me that there's a risk, more than a risk, I think there's a reality of damaging one's uh, standing. Uh, it cannot be explained in terms of the material benefits uh, of nuclear trade. Uh, on the other hand, if you ask the question, what might be other benefits that one could derive from being uh, a full, lead, uh, full member of the NSG, you could say that, well, in addition to prestige generally being part of the club, uh, then maybe you uh, further erode the distinction between being a de facto uh, nuclear weapons state and a nuclear weapons possessor. Uh, maybe this is part of the path to trying to uh, obtain membership uh, on the uh, UN Security Council. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I, I thought the question you raised when was an important one. And I, I don't find the explanation that it's mainly in terms of what might, might obtain in terms of nuclear trade to be really very compelling because it's not obvious to me what they would obtain differently than what they currently have. So that's true, but we have already entered the other three uh, export control regimes as of January 2018. We are members of the other three. So the idea was to make it a nice four. But the NSG has different requirements. That's the catch. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I mean, we are also aware that just like a one time exception is given, requirements can always be bent. And obviously, if you remember that since it operates on the basis of consensus, you would be in a position to. Well, that is what China is doing. But remember that the other NSG members, the big NSG members, are actually in favor of our getting in. If you discount China. That's the only one which is opposing among the uh, nuclear weapon states. That may be the case, but it, okay, I, I, okay, I, I don't want to uh, <laughs> continue just a, a, a kind of a bilateral conversation. Please. Uh, since we are talking about issue with China. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. sorry. Ratna, born in Sri Lanka, NPT, a non proliferation and terrorism stud, study student here. My my question here, I was born in down south of Sri Lanka and the port of the southern port of Sri Lanka was Amatota. Yes. Bought by China, by China meaning ninety nine year lease, seventy percent ownership by the Chinese government company. So the question is, if they were to bring in the nuclear submarines, would India feel threatened? Will it be another Cuban missile crisis that happened here in the US when the Soviets were trying to bring in the missiles? Will that be something similar to that if China does? A very interesting question. First question is, will you allow it? Sri Lanka. We have no choice because it's owned by China. That particular area. But there must have been something in the treaty which said you can't do everything you like. They can't declare put up the flag, flag of China there, can they? It's a company. Although the flags are, the Sri Lankan flag was here, it was brought down. The Chinese flag is here, now equal. Alright, well then. Well, we'll have to see when that happens. But in any case, just like China gets the shingles if uh, we send a nuclear uh, submarine or uh, any ship to South China Sea, 
we will also have to take uh, i mean we will also be on the watch and uh, but we don't really think that uh, the chinese are going to bring the submarine to hamantota and then fire off i i mean it doesn't look very likely and why would they do it anyway i mean china all said and done is a very responsible uh, power and is uh, does things entirely with its self interest and i don't think this forms part of their self interest what you are saying is a strategy is a situation of war between india and china god forbid that and let's hope that never happens yes we will be i am not predicting that i'm just talking about the string of pearls just you know string of pearls is something which is anyway being done by china all around us i mean the, their idea is to insert it yeah? and uh, this is also an attempt to make sure that we stay within our regional waters and we stay confined to our own things and don't aspire to the high table which is what they did it's very amusing how the chinese have proceeded because i was serving in beijing in 91 to 94 and uh, you could make out then that they that time they were not on the high table at all and uh, they uh, realized very early because the soviet union had uh, crumbled uh, they realized that the only people that they need to sort of appease were the us and uh, the, the, the idea but i don't think the us realized it at that time that the whole attempt was not to sit at the high table with the us it was to unseat the us so that is a policy of china i mean that is how they operate but uh, but that is i mean as it is we will be uh, i think this nuclear this attempt to guard in circles that is such a part of their strategy because they want to see they want to uh, limit our potential for growth and they are not very happy at the fact that as a democratic as the largest democracy in the world we have a certain play with countries including those in the west which they don't thank you yeah this is the last chance uh, who wants uh, a final word please I'm from China, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Chinese Timothy apologize for being from China, but go ahead, please. For being here, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Any weapons on you? Uh, my name is Sophie. Um, I'm a conference interpretation student, second year, but I'm also doing a certificate in non-proliferation studies. I have one question that is, um, have India ever considered the back precedence that it will set if, you, if, if India successfully gets into NSG. Will other countries follow suit? We'll we'll just you know develop bonds and then we just don't care what you know everybody else says and then we'll just you know enjoy all the benefits that the um, you know the uh, other countries have you know for peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, firstly, it was a one-time exception which was given for us. It wasn't given to everybody. So the same logic. Uh, can always be used to say that we are getting India in, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are opening the door to anybody else. Secondly, with all due respect to China, your country was not even a member of the UN. One of the strongest supporters to get your country into the UN was India. So we, uh, you know, we just want to remind you that uh, there is a blank check which you have in honour. <laughs> okay. <coughs> anybody else? Uh, please. I'm from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this discussion is not really about China. So I'm just like interested in the relationship between Trump, like the U.S. president, and um, and India in terms of like nuclear capacities, because we know like um, Trump has a strategy called like, Indo-Pacific strategy. And I'm just interested, like, what are the prospects of this strategy in terms of the nuclear capacity development for um, India and um, America? Will there be more like um, collaborations to deter China? And um, how do you see the prospect of the co collaboration? Thank you. First of all, I must tell you that India's desire is not to deter China. India's desire is not to deter anybody. we are in fact people ask me what are you developing nuclear weapons for what what are you trying to acquire greater power for what are you trying to do this this is not for world domination this is not to make ourselves the supreme power on earth or even a super power that is not our aspiration our aspiration is to feed our people our aspiration is to bring bread on the plates of people our aspiration is to be developed 
to have a situation where our people can stand up with pride and function on par with those people in the developed world. That is our goal. And in this quest, we see whatever we see as blocking this quest, we are trying to remove those blocks. Now, given that situation, we have with the United States ever since uh, for the last several, uh, uh, more than 10 years now, uh, an increasingly improving relationship, which I am happy to say today is at the best it has ever been historically uh, between us in the last 70 years. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, for the first time, very close military cooperation, well, a military level cooperation with uh, the United States. Um, when I say first time, I mean not now, it was pre-Trump. It was uh, several years ago that we commenced naval exercises called the Malabar with, between India, Japan and the United States, which continues every year. We are also part of the RIMPAC group, uh, which China is also part of it. Uh, so uh, we are very closely collaborating in all three areas, in the Army, in the Navy and in the Air Force with the United States. We also have very strong cooperation in counter-terrorism, in border security, in internal security. And uh, so I see a situation where uh, there is a parallelism of interests. Uh, of the US and India in this sector. Uh, the US of course is pursuing its strategies with regard to its position elsewhere in the world but our position is that we see this relationship as reinforcing us. After all it was the US which led the pack in getting us the NSG exception. It was the US which, it is the US which is now engaging us and we are with, with whom we are deeply engaged in uh, military and uh, security arrangements. It is also the United States which uh, is now our largest uh, military supplier. Uh, we are buying more than 20 billion dollars worth of equipment from the US. So I think it's a completely different ball game in terms of our relationship with the United States over the last several years. But uh, as I see it, we are not doing this relationship to deter anybody else or to fight with anybody else. This is to be done as I started this conversation to improve our people. Yes, please. Just one remark. Mm -hmm. You what mentioned you earlier, you said... Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Hudar. I, I work with the Defense Language Institute. I'm a faculty member. Um, your goal is not to turn and you, you're trying to feed your people. But then, earlier you mentioned you want to give up the uh, nuclear propulsion. Is, then you want to give up the idea of feeding your people? No, no, no. Where giving up nuclear weapons mm -hmm. is going to deter my people from getting food. Mm -hmm. Because other people will then home in on me. I will not do it. Mm -hmm. Where everybody agrees to give up nuclear weapons and I will be the first to lead that back where everybody else does, mm -hmm. I will be the first to do so because I don't think that's going to feed my people. That is what I am trying to say. I am eager to see a situation where we have universal, non-discriminatory, comprehensive disarmament in a phased manner. If we can achieve that and we can all, then we will be simultaneously much better off. We won't be wasting so much money in maintaining this nuclear arsenal and other things and we can use, divert that money to feeding our people. I think what we, we illustrated today, at least in, in my perspective, are the tremendous problems we confront moving forward. Whether you, you talk about Article 6 as your benchmark, whether you talk about the ban treaty as your benchmark, uh, you pick whatever uh, uh, treaty or principle that you think is important with respect to disarmament. Because it's clear, to me at least, that you pick any country that has nuclear weapons and they will say that those weapons are important for its security, which in turn is important for all the other good things that they want to achieve. You talk to any country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, and they will say that their own security interests are in great jeopardy because of the nuclear weapons possessed by others. 
And so everybody wants everything to happen at once. Uh, we want this harmonious situation, but no one is prepared really to take the first step. Uh, and that's why, unfortunately, I tell our students who are entering our nonproliferation and terrorism program uh, that there will be jobs waiting for them when they graduate. Uh, it may be, I mean, in some ways, they, they, the worse the world situation, the better our job prospects. I wish it were the other way around. But thank you so much, Ambassador, for a very, I think, provocative and stimulating.